Well, good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church and Word for the Week, our online book study series. My name is Pastor Jeremy Heikem, and I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, if you've never joined us for our uh, book study series, and what we do is we read our way through a particular book, and uh, you read a chapter uh, each week, and then we'll discuss it here on this video. So if you, it's your first time joining us, uh, very glad that you are here with us. Today we start a new book. Uh, the book is called The Prayer of Agar, The Prayer of Agar. Uh, it is by Jay Payleitner. Um, and it is uh, uh, published by Multinoma Books. So hopefully you were able to, to get your book or your Kindle version of the book. Um, this is a very interesting look uh, at Proverbs chapter 30. Uh, if you haven't taken some time yet to go and read through Proverbs chapter 30, I encourage you to do that. It will certainly make the, the chapter make a lot more sense. Um, but uh, what Payleitner has done here is taken sort of a, an unknown character of Scripture. I mean, probably before this book, how many of you even heard of Agar? Um, but uh, taking this unknown character and a, a really beautiful prayer that he has written um, as part of chapter 30 of the book of Proverbs. And we're going to break that down slowly over, you know, uh, uh, several weeks here. So today we start really with the introduction and with chapter one. I'm not going to really focus too much on the introduction, but if you didn't read it, do go back and, and read it because there are three um, sort of ways in which uh, the, the author says, this is why I think that the prayer of Agar and the, and the, the chapter 30 of Proverbs is, is so important to how we understand um, uh, several key components in our life like humility and contentedness and satisfaction. And so be sure to read the introduction uh, and, and, um, and take time to really consider um, the purpose for this book. Um, in chapter 1 though, chapter 1 is titled Major Impact from a Minor Character. And at the very beginning of the chapter, our author says, Agar recognizes there is much he does not know, but he asks good questions. And that's really the heart of where I want to uh, be with you today. I don't want to kind of read for you page by page this chapter. There'd be no point to that. Um, but I want to talk about the idea of having questions. I think we all do have questions. We have questions about um, how God functions sometimes. Um, we have questions about some of his characteristics. Uh, even simple questions like, you know, is God really this good? Does he really love us this much? How can he love us this much? How can he be this good? Or sometimes we go to the other side and we say, how could God allow this? Um, how could God just sit back while such evil is happening or other kinds of things? So I think we have lots of questions. We also, though, sometimes do have doubts, right? We do have doubts. I think if we were really truthful with ourselves, if we really sat down and thought about it, we would realize there are many pieces of God's word that, um, or, or even not just pieces of God's word, there are many moments in our lives where we would really recognize, wow, I... I don't, I don't know if I really trust that. I don't know if I really know that to be true, right? Sometimes we doubt certain things um, about life, about God, about his word. And so the beauty of this prayer of Agar is that we're basically going to make this statement. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to not be 100% for sure. And it's okay because what those questions ought to do, should do, is drive us deeper into God's word, looking for the answers, knowing that sometimes we're going to approach questions or things in his word that we're just simply not going to know, we're, there's not going to be an answer for. But many times those questions push us deeper into the word and then we find something we've never read before. We find something we've never understood before and we now understand it or, or, or hear it or see it differently. And so as we kind of think about this chapter uh, this morning, I thought it was great at the bottom of page eight. Um, Payleitner says, in this chapter, and especially in his prayer, Agar admits he doesn't have all the answers and he asks for help. He confesses that falsehoods occasionally fall from his lips, 
right? Flow from his mouth. Sometimes the things he says aren't true. We all know that reality. He can't always discern between the truth and the lies he hears from other people. Wow, I've been in that position before. I know you certainly have as well. He knows he needs a certain cash flow, but he doesn't want too much or too little. I, I think we all kind of understand that. And so the idea, Paylatner says, that a prophet and a contributor to the Bible lives with a bit of angst and uncertainty should be a comfort. In this life, it's okay if we don't have all the answers. God welcomes our doubts and our questions. Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So as we start this book, I want to offer you um, three questions to consider. Three questions to consider, okay? Um, the f and and, and uh, maybe you'll want to jot these questions down or come back and listen to the video again as you think about them over this week. But here's the first question. What are some of the truths of Scripture that are hard for you to completely understand? What are some things in scriptures that are that that are that are really hard for you to understand fully and completely? Um, I think if I could give you an example of this, one thing that I've always, I mean, I trust this. I know this to be true. I, I believe God's word fully in it, but it's just been hard for me to wrap my mind around is the idea of how Jesus could take two uh, fish and or, or two loaves of bread and five fish and, and, and feed thousands and thousands of people. How does that happen? You know, I mean, it's um, to me, it, it feels like magic, right? And, and I just, I, I don't believe in the idea of magic. I believe that magic is nothing more than sleight of hand. And, and Jesus wasn't simply sleight of, this isn't sleight of hand. How did he do that? How did he, un, I struggle with that one. I struggle with some of those things. I, it's not that I don't believe them. I know they happened. I trust they happened. But but how? Like, how did that actually come to be? So what are some of the truths of Scripture that are hard for you to understand? Second question you might ask is, um, when it comes to contentedness, is there a number? Is there a, a an amount? Is there a, a, a point, a place where it is enough? And what is enough? How much is enough? And, and it doesn't really matter what we're talking about, whether it's money or it's grace or it's, uh, um, you know, your house or your car. Or I don't know, whatever it is. How much is truly enough? How would you define enough? And then thirdly, I'd like you to think about this question. Can you think of a time when God's love completely outweighed, completely outweighed your failure? Can you think about a time when God's love completely outweighed your failure? So these three things, I think, will help to get us sort of set for what we're going to read about Agar's prayer and about the person Agar from Proverbs chapter 30. So what are some of the truths of Scripture that are hard for you to understand? How much is enough? And can you think of a time when God's love outweighed your failures? Now, as we're reading through this book, I want to uh, encourage you that at the very back of your book, starting on page, starting on page 89, is a, um, is a collection of questions that the author has written for you, sort of like a um, personal reflection guide, if you will. And you'll notice that there are questions for chapter for the introduction in chapter one. And I would love you to look at those questions as well. And I'm going to talk for just a quick second as we wrap up this morning about the first question. What is a life lesson you've learned from a biblical character? And the person that I'm going to uh, bring to mind is someone that uh, that Jay Payleitner talks about in this chapter. Simeon, the priest who um, Mary and Joseph bring the infant Jesus to, uh, to be dedicated in the temple. I think um, the lesson that I learned from Simeon, right, is that there are these moments in our life where God puts something in front of us, and it is completely astounding, completely unbelievable. Uh, we are moved to an emotional response, tears, um, shouts of joy, um, 
there, there are moments like this in our lives. And when <clears throat> my wife uh, became pregnant, it was clear we were going to have a, a son. Um, I began to think about all of the moments in scripture where God had sort of made an example for me of how I should uh, respond to the gift of a son. And one of them that was so clear from the very beginning for me was with Simeon and how Mary and Joseph dutifully bought, brought Jesus to the temple and had the priest raise him up, dedicate him, uh, give him over to the service of the Lord. And what blows my mind about this is that here is Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, and his parents still had to bring him to the temple to be dedicated for the service of God. Because in his humanness and in their humanness, it isn't natural. It isn't natural that we would just serve God. And so even though Jesus is God, he's the Son of God, there's still this humanness about him whereby serving God is not natural. It's something we have to be reminded to do, something we have to make a commitment to do. And so here Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to Simeon, and Simeon weeps with joy. And he sings that beautiful song that we call the Nook de Minas. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and for all of the people of the nations. My eyes have seen your salvation, Simeon says. I think the lesson that I learned from Simeon is let's not ever look past. Let's not ever look beyond. Let's not ever forsake or, or, or misunderstand the amazing moments that God brings in our lives where we see him so clearly. That's what Simeon was doing. He's saying, God, I see you. I literally see you, God, in the, in the, in the bones, in the skin, in the face of this little baby that I'm raising up to you for your glory, for yours alone. I finally see it, God. I finally see your salvation. And so let's not look beyond those really great moments that God gives to us. Let's learn something from them. Let's be amazed. Let's be moved to tears at how good and gracious our God is to us. Who is it for you? What Bible character has taught you something, made you stop and think about something about God a little bit more? I'd love if you're willing to share these um, with us. So if you have time, just send me a quick email um, or uh, you know text or something of that nature. And, and just let me know, who are the Bible characters from, from whom you have learned something more about God, something really great, something really awesome about who God is. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting into the prayer of Agar with you. Um, again, this first chapter is just kind of uh, setting us up, right? It's getting us ready. And next week, we are going to start to read uh, the first part of this prayer, um, where Agar talks about how he is weary, how he is worn, but because God is who God is. He will prevail. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this. Hope that you'll stick with us as we read together the prayer of Agar from J. Pay Leitner. Uh, looking forward to seeing you very, very soon again next week. Have a great week, everybody.